I think, yeah, sorry, my height. All right. In 1996, the song 15 Million People was a huge hit within the Netherlands. For 34 weeks following, this song was on top of the national charge. Don't worry, I won't sing it for you now, but the lyrics were along the lines of this small, tolerant, down-to-earth, sweet country, lacking too much, too much respect for authorities whatsoever. Let's call it the laid-back, rebellious child of Europe. If I'm honest, I might be idealizing a bit, but, but for me, this song portrays exactly the way I remember the Netherlands from my youth, and I think it also envisions how the world used to see the Netherlands traditionally. Okay, and of course, we're also known for pot. Last week, I was listening to this song again, and I just couldn't believe how much has changed ever since. I know that people still actually always uh, address the Netherlands when they talk to, about tolerance and how we actually should deal with another, but I have a little bit of a different vision. Looking back, I think things start, started changing already in 1991, when Fritz Bolkestein, it's a former Dutch politician, mentioned in a speech at the European, that European societies should be aware of the presence of Muslims and think about how we should relate to Islam and our own liberal roots. According to the book European Multiculturalism Revisited, Bolkestein referred not so much to the assumed effects of Islam on individual migrants' attitude, but more to the place of Islam as a religious denomination in Western societies. I think when Bolkestein entered the stage, it seemed like the start of a new global tendency. Tolerance was for the weak, and freedom of speech was the new holy grail. Many thought the time had come to speak their minds and finally say up front what they thought, mainly about Islam. One decade later, a new start was rising within the Netherlands. He was called Pim Fortuyn. It was an openly gay populist politician who stuck up for Jews, and I have to say this was very extraordinary and also contradictory at the time. He became politically active just before 9-11, and he was very skeptical against Islam. This was, unfortunately, exactly what many people wanted to hear in the aftermath of the tragic events. Uh, however, in February 2002, he got kicked out of his party, called Leef bij Nederland, because he'd said in an interview that he was in favor of abrog abrogating the first and most important article in our constitution. No one should be discriminated upon. He started his own party, which became very successful, but then, just two weeks before the general elections on May 6, uh, 2002, he got killed by an extreme left-wing animal activists. Uh, let me be very clear that I reject this deed and any kind of violence, but still, I was quite surprised and also shocked to hear actually many of my friends say, oh, we're mourning our white leader. Oh, it's quite extreme language, but a lot of people use this language for, for this populist politician. And for me personally, being a grandchild of four Holocaust survivors who somehow miraculously survived, uh, the horrors of persecution, but still lost a lot of their relatives on the way. It made me actually sick to hear this kind of language or white leader again. I might be naive, and I, as I said, I was only 16 years old, and I hoped uh, it was just a period of time or just a small time frame or the emotion. But unfortunately, I learned that I had better get used to this kind of language. I'm not sure if you have heard about uh, Geert Wilders. He's a, a Dutch politician, the blunt frontman of the PVV party, the Party for Freedom. And last year, he actually said that he wanted to able a law that prohibits reading the Koran. He also said he would like to close all mosques, if necessary, help by police forces. And when the refugee crisis emerged in 2015 in the Netherlands, which is a whole story in itself, he called asylum seekers testosterone bombs. After our last general election, in March of this year, our current prime minister, who is in charge of the biggest party, the Liberals, said the Netherlands had stopped the uprise of populism after the Brexit and Trump. Actually, I couldn't disagree more. It is true that the Party for Freedom did not become the biggest party with Wilders. He became second. 
But in order to gain more votes, what you saw was that the whole discourse of most political parties went more to the right wing of the spec spectrum of the right wing all the time, if not the far right. It's a trend you see almost everywhere around the world, at least from my European perspective, I learned to say yesterday. Politicians who acknowledge and comfort the angry citizens and who rely on freedom of speech get into power. Also, if that means they hurt other groups within our society severely. I think, in the case of the Netherlands, Geert Wilders might be past to speak now, actually, but his newest rival, Thierry Baudet, he's a politician from a party called Forum of Democracy, could even become more dangerous. He says similar things about Islam mainly, and he also fights the so-called established order with the older parties, more traditional parties. But what's different is that he attracts an intellectual electorate who makes his visions almost seem bon ton and interesting. We, and I think this is also a global phenomenon, start to live more and more within our own bubble, fighting our own battles, and alienating from everyone who is different from ourselves. I think this is partly encouraged by the use of social media and the algorithms that decide our personal needs and favors. But still, I think it's too easy to blame it entirely on technological aspects of digital advancements. More and more, I get the idea that we stop talking to those who might be not exactly on the same page as we are altogether. If I'm honest, this is something I'm no stranger to myself. Growing up in a middle-class Jewish home, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in a fairly prosperous neighborhood in Amsterdam, most of my friends and acquaintances came from similar backgrounds than I am. I actually never really felt the need to break out of my bubble and meet people with other views on life. However, for me, every, everything changed during the summer of 2014. The Gaza war was at its peak, and I got asked to participate in a live television show on this topic. There, I said that it hurt me a lot to see the tensions in the Middle East conflict get exported into the Dutch streets, that I understood it, but that it was very tensed uh, between Jews and Muslims, mostly in the Netherlands. And I also said that I might be Jewish myself, and I do believe in the right of existence for Israel, but that I suffered from sleepless nights ever since I saw images of all those babies killed in Gaza, and that I think we had to stop the occupation. I made an appeal to Jews and Muslims in the Netherlands to go and find each other to talk instead of fight. To mark my words, I also made some kind of stupid joke, like we are much more similar than we might think we all eat falafel and hummus in the end. Not everyone thought it was funny because directly afterwards, this one girl walked to me straight away and she, she wore a shirt with a printed text, Free Gaza. She looked me in the face and she called me a dirty fascist because I hadn't denounced the existence of Israel altogether. I was shocked, and when I came home that night, checked my Facebook, I saw all kinds of comments of friends from the Jewish community calling me a traitor and a self-hating Jew. They told me I wasn't welcome anymore to their events because I hadn't defended Netanyahu and his policy. Although I felt horrible, I just knew something was terribly, terribly wrong and it needed to be fixed. So in the years that followed, I became a member of many dialogue platforms, particularly between young Muslims and Jews in the Netherlands. And we talked on a deeper level about our dreams and fears. We celebrated each other's holiday, visited each other's neighborhood, and sometimes had heated discussions, of course. One of the most interesting things that I experienced during this kind of work is a visit to the former concentration camp Auschwitz with a group of young Muslims. One of the participants, he was only 22 years old, ran out of the guest chamber and he cried. He told me he was afraid the same thing could happen to him as a Muslim one day because of the current Islamophobic climate. When I shed a tear myself, he hugged me and said, we are on a mission, Natasha. We'll tell what we saw today to everyone in the world, whether they want to listen or not, so your relatives didn't die for nothing. And it was very touching, because he said that after his fear came out so purely. 
Personally, I chose to concentrate on the relationship between Jews and Muslim, which is not in the last place often so dense because of the Middle East conflict. I wrote a whole book about it, I can be clear on that. But I think you can apply these kind of dialogues to all kind of groups within society, thinking they can't get along for whatever reason. I can't tell you how many times I've been scolded by both groups. I learned not to care anymore. People who fight for change often don't do this to become popular. But here's my point. Even though this kind of work is very empowering at times, uh, definitely in an interesting era like ours, it sometimes feels like it's nothing more than a drop in the ocean. I've wrote articles on it, even a whole book, as I said, talk to politicians, initiated forums, and most people are really enthusiastic for the case of dialogue, but sometime, somehow I keep on meeting the same 50 people over and over again. At times it makes me exhausted to always preach to the choir. Having a dialogue might not be the most sexy form to, way to form connections, and I have to say in Dutch there's even a, a term made up by skeptics of dialogue, it's called drinking tea, because we do nothing more than drink tea together. But in a world that is polarizing more and more, I think we can't live without it. Dialogue shows me the true meaning of free speech, because you can talk openly to one another instead of about each other. And listen, if I talk about dialogue, I don't pledge for holding hands and singing Kumbaya, my lord, and hugging each other around a crispy bonfire, cuddling everyone. In my eyes, a dialogue should also be honest and abrasive at times. As long as we deliver our opinions in respectful ways, we should always be able to be open to one another. My question is, it's quite simple. How can we make dialogue more appealing to large crowds? I've often noticed that people who benefit most from it are not interested in participating, but in order to make it really work and fight the, fight the disunity of the world we live in today, we should get them involved. But how? Thank you.